extra. They're all special, but today is especially special for a few reasons. One, this is the GI's 100th live stream, if you can believe it. We don't count the ones that we did before COVID started because, well, we had to start somewhere. And so we start with the ones that we did in summer of 2020 on our YouTube channel. Of course, we've got Geostrata Extra. We have oh, our lectures that we do every year. Of course, there are all those great recorded videos up there, and you should check all of those out too. I'm Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we welcome you to one of our longest running series now. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute and you've just stumbled upon this today, after you watch us today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org and there you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists. And of course, if you like what you see today, and this is a very important announcement, we're almost to 12,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. If everybody watching today goes and subscribes right now, we'll get over that 12,000 and we would really appreciate that. So if you like what you see, click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. So one final thing before we get started today. Geostrata Extra is designed as a companion piece for the print magazine. Geostrata comes out six times a year. It says on the cover that the Geo Institute proudly publishes Geostrata, and that is true. We are very proud of it. So every time we have a new issue out, we do one of these. This is designed to be a little bit of behind the article. You get an interview with one of the authors from the current issue who might tell you some stuff who didn't make it into the article that didn't make it into the article. Maybe what their thought process was as they wrote it and a whole bunch of other things. So we are very excited today to have uh, our presentation on bio-inspired geotechnics and deep foundations from Alejandro Martinez, a UC Davis. He is going to be interviewed by one of our crack editors from the <laughs> publication, Ken Fishman, coming to us from Buffalo, New York. And at this point, after I made him laugh like that, this is where I send it over to Ken. Ken, thank you for doing this. Alejandro, thanks for doing this. And thanks both of you guys for being with us. Take it away. Thank you, Brad, for that introduction. And uh, uh, thank you, Alex, for, for being here. Or I should say Professor Martin is, but I'll, I'll be a little more informal and just say Alex. Uh, but for those of you that uh, you know haven't seen it, and even those that have, um, Alex's article was uh, in a Geostrata article, uh, uh, issue that was themed Biomediated and Bio-Inspired Geotechnics. I think almost every article uh, that was in this magazine was, or in this issue was uh, prepared and submitted by uh, a researcher that is involved in the NSF Center for Biomediated and Bio-Inspired Geotechnics. And... Uh, uh, I know Alex has been involved in this group for some time, and, and uh, I, I think he was telling me that recently uh, he was just, he has just become one of the uh, principal investigators for for this effort. So, um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, that research center and and, and and what goes on there? Um, I think we've got a good flavor for it from all the different articles in there. But uh, uh, what's the the history of that, and, and uh, you know uh, what's going on? Yeah, certainly. Thank you, uh, Ken. So the Center for Biomediated and, and Bioinspired Geotechnics, or CBBG for short, uh, is uh, funded by NSF, and uh, it's funded for a period of 10 years. And so as, as the name implies, it's, uh, a, it's geotech, but considering uh, all the interactions with biology. And it has these two parts, biomediated, which uh, essentially boils down to using a biological uh, process to, to improve a geotechnical system. So, for example, biocementation is, is a very common biomediated technique, but also for a contaminant remediation, there's biological processes that break certain contaminants. And so that's also related. And then the other part is bio-inspired geotechnics, which 
uh, is, is a, a younger field. Uh, so by Inspired Geotechnics has been around maybe as long as the center has been around uh, as, a, as a more um, established kind of subfield of, uh, of geotech. And so by Inspired Geotechnics, we look at nature. Uh, we look at an animal or a plant and we uh, understand how that animal or plant interacts with soil, how uh, a root grows or how a worm or a clam or an ant or a different animal uh, excavates and burrows. And then we learn lessons from the animals and then we apply those to solve a geotechnical, uh, geotechnical problem. So the, both parts use, use uh, biology, but one literally uses a biological process that's biomediated, whereas by inspired, we learn from nature and then we modify that. Well, thank you. As I, as I said, uh, uh, you have been involved with this group for, uh, for quite some time, and, and I noticed that you had a title there for a while as a, as a diversity lead. Um, and I was a little confused about that, because I know nature uh, uh, has what we call a biodiversity, and there's a, a lot to be learned from that. I was wondering if there's any relationship between being a diversity leader and, and, and what's going on in nature. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the CBBG has uh, certainly the research mission, but another mission uh, of the center is to also contribute and make advancements in education and in inclusion. And so this uh, efforts, and there's a lot of efforts on increasing diversity. Uh, there's a different uh, lead in each campus. And uh, I served at the, as the UC Davis campus. And, and the goal here is to uh, increase the, the diversity of, of biogeotechnics uh, to, to bring diversity within the field to levels that represent, you know, the population of the U.S. And so we look at uh, things like diversity of uh, ethnic backgrounds, of, of race, gender, um, individuals with disabilities, uh, and so on. And, and so a lot of uh, that part of the center is um, uh, increasing the opportunities that those individuals have and, and, and so that they, they can also do graduate uh, education, they can go and work in, in geotechnical companies, government uh, agencies, and, and, and so on. And as you mentioned, Ken, yes, I think there's a very uh, elegant uh, parallel there because, and, and we probably know this uh, from all the agriculture, right, that crops are, are stronger, they're more resilient to disease and to uh, just failure when there's diversity in the gene pool. The issue of just having one uh, very narrow uh, uh, band of genes or of characteristics in, in, in a crop is that if, if a pest comes or a disease comes, then there's no diversity. And so if, if it really attacks that, that, that one variation, then it's catastrophic. But if there's a lot of diversity, like it happens in nature, then um, some individuals don't survive, but many others do, and then they continue evolving. And so the, the, there is this this nice parallel in, in that increasing diversity makes makes uh, you know that that our field stronger. That's for sure. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting, and I I, uh, I see you've been doing quite well. Um, uh, through the center and your other activities, uh, you graduated uh, with your bachelor's in 2010 from the University of Texas at Austin, and then did some graduate work, including a master's and a PhD and postdoc at Georgia Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, you joined uh, UC Davis in 2016, so six years after uh, after your undergrad. Uh, uh, and then um, I noticed that you did get an NSF Career Award, which is, I think, the uh, uh, awarded to, to promising young researchers who have embarked on a field that uh, is going to uh, uh, that's being initiated and is going to uh, uh, expand into the future. Uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about the career award and 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 uh, how that may relate to uh, to where you are today? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, yes, the, the 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 NSF career award uh, has the topic of. Uh, um, soil penetration, essentially the, the fact that in many of the, the activities we do in geotechnical engineering and, and just in construction in general, uh, it involves 
penetrating the soil or excavating the soil. And, and so now it, it turns out that's a very energy intensive activity. It takes a lot of energy to push something in the ground. And there's also all these other issues like refusal, right? Or, or damaging piles when we're driving them or um, when we're doing a, a, a cone penetration test or a standard penetration test, once we hit a dense layer, sometimes we just can't go through it. And so the, the, the topic of this project is to learn from nature and, and how different organisms uh, burrow, penetrate soils, and so and, and then apply those lessons to geotechnical engineering. So, for example, we're looking at how roots, uh, plant roots uh, grow within the soil. And uh, one very interesting thing is that a, a root doesn't just grow and, and push, you know, in a straight pattern. There's two different things that, that roots grow. One is they kind of follow a, a kind of a helical path uh, uh, as they go down and there's reasons for it. And, and the other one is when a root encounters uh, a stiff layer, uh, instead of just going straight, it's going to start growing laterally. And what that does is that, that, that relieves the stress ahead of the root and then that allows it to, to then grow forward. And so, the project really is about understanding those mechanisms. Uh, now, in biology, uh, people have studied these ones, but the 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 geomechanics of it, the the explanation for why this works better in a soil, uh, is what we are focusing on. And then at the back end, uh, implementing those on on geotechnical. Uh, applications like site characterization or installation of sensors or uh, uh, on the sensor part is, is the, the where, what has been our focus but I see this as also potentially being applicable to installation of piles or um, tunneling and, and other applications as well. Um, so as I mentioned you won a, a number of different awards uh, for your work uh, and one of them uh, that's uh, uh, particularly prestigious is the uh, Casa Grande Award that was uh, awarded by the Teo Institute in, in 2022. And for those that, that might not know, this is an award that's given to a, to a, a young, uh, a, usually a young professor, uh, who's excelling in uh, teaching, research, professional service, as well as community service. So uh, the question I wanted to ask is, so, uh, how have you, uh, or have you uh, integrated the results of your research uh, into teaching? So are you are you talking about uh, bio-inspired solutions in classes and in, 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 uh, in the foundation engineering class, or, or how are you going about this? Yes, no, that that's a great question, and and uh, yes, the uh, whenever I have an opportunity to to talk about what we're doing in research and. In, in classes and not only what we're doing here at UC Davis, but you know, promising new research that uh, in my opinion has potential to, to bring benefits to our industry and potentially uh, improve our, our, our industry. Uh, yes, I'll take every single opportunity to do that. And, and so at UC Davis, I teach a lot of the foundation classes on the graduate and graduate. And so a lot of these you know, root inspired anchors, root inspired foundations, uh, will come into play, but also their technologies like, for example, uh, energy piles that uh, work as heat exchangers uh, with the ground. And so I think it's important to um, communicate that to, to, to the undergraduate students so that they can see, I mean, certainly in class they're learning the design methods and, and the state of practice, but I think it's important for them to also what's what, what may be coming in the future. And, and I think another topic is uh, just the way we're going to have to change design uh, as a result of, of climate change and that soil properties and soil conditions that we thought, you know, we designed a given foundation or, or something for these conditions, well, those might change and the loads might change over time. And so I think that in a way requires a more dynamic philosophy in design. Uh, and so I do try to bring that as much as possible. And I also try uh, at any given point in time, I have a, a number of undergraduate students working uh, in, in research as well. And, and that's been another another way to 
uh, to share that with with undergraduate students to either pair them with with the graduate students or just direct them uh, on on a research project on their own has also been really um, rewarding. So with that as a backdrop, let's let's back up a little bit before we start to get into some of the details of the article and your research. And how did you first get interested in this uh, uh, bio-inspired uh, uh, foundation design topic? Yeah, so um, I, I was thinking about this, and I, I think it's uh, maybe three 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 reasons I can backtrack. Uh, the the first one I think comes from my preparation at Georgia Tech, and that I mean my time at Georgia Tech as a grad student, um, working with David Frost. David uh, was my advisor. He he really has this. Um, natural talent and ability to think outside the box and always think of ways to to improve uh, what we do and, and in a very creative manner combine different disciplines and so that was part of my preparation uh, in graduate school at georgia tech uh, and, and i think another person that was really instrumental in in that period of time for me was uh carlos santa marina that that mm. does very i mean very nice, very elegant work on on soil behavior, and so in a way that also sparked my curiosity for how soils behave uh, in all these complex processes and physical uh, physics and, and chemistry that go into the soils. And so that, in a way, implanted the seed of okay, what 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 else can be done? Um, I think also personal interest. I've always enjoyed. Uh, learning more about animals and plants i've uh, you know always loved having pets but you know going to zoos aquariums and read and, and look at photographs and all of that stuff for how animals just do all these crazy things that um you know biologically speaking are almost impossible for for humans you see how certain animals climb or run or swim or do all of the above uh and so i always had that personal interest and this is more of a joke, but particularly for, for the snakeskin one, I usually say that uh, the third reason is fulfilling my childhood frustrated dream of having a pet snake that my parents never allowed me to. Uh, and so now that, uh, uh, you know, as a professor at UC Davis, I was like, okay, maybe we can do something else uh, with snakes. And so that all kind of, you know, combined uh, and, but really, I mean, the, the, what we're doing with the snakeskin inspired surfaces and the tree root inspired anchors and foundations, I mean, that that's all really related to, to what I've been doing since my PhD, which is load transfer, soil structure interaction um, and site characterization. And, and so, but we're, we're looking at it from a different angle of uh, can we implement a principle that's that animals and plants do bring it to geotechnical engineering um, and what one of the really interesting things to me about this field is that we're trying to to make this translation right from from biology to to geotechnical engineering but there's a really big difference there which is that uh, a root let's say the root of a plant is very small you know it may be this big maybe half an inch uh, and it's very shallow, you know, 5 kPa of effective stress or less. How do you translate that to a deep foundation that's going to be 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters below the ground with much bigger sizes? And so there's this really big difference in sizes, in effective stresses, and also in time scales, right? We need to build fast, whereas um, animals and plants take a long time to grow. And so that, in my opinion, is, is an essential part of this puzzle of learning something from nature, but not just applying it directly to geotech, but, but evaluating what's the effect of making everything bigger, what's the effect of going deeper. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of the, the geomechanics, uh, a lot of the interesting geomechan geomechanical questions uh, come into play. Well, I, I like that answer. It kind of leads me right into my next question. Um, uh, which will also include just a short one is, is uh, so now that you're out on your own and, and you, you don't have to listen to your parents anymore, do, do you have a pet snake? And 
<clears throat> number two, um, uh, what are your different research interests that kind of uh, combine uh, and kind of work together to address this problem? It's, uh, as, as, as you mentioned a number of times, um, you know, in, in your writings, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary uh, type of task in, in, in research. And so I, I, I think a, a lot of topics have to come together. How, how have you been able to do this? Yeah, 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 that, that's for sure. And, and that, that is, I think, one of the, the, the beauties of the, the professor job, that in a way we have the freedom to pursue our own research interests. And I mean, certainly they need to contribute to, to our field, uh, but we have this uh, uh, intellectual freedom to, to pursue it, uh, different topics, but also pursue them from different angles. And so the, the soil structure interaction, load transfer, interface shear behavior has kind of been the, the, the central part of what I've done since my PhD. And so um, in, in my PhD, I was looking at effects of uh, surface properties, like surface roughness, surface hardness, how they affect the behavior of a pile but also how they can be used uh, to characterize soils. So imagine a CPT, but instead of the smooth sleeve, we have a, a sleeve with a particular pattern that tells us more about the soil. And so that's where all of the soil structure interaction and side characterization come into play. And, and but then continuing us uh, at UC Davis, uh, thinking of what are different ways or different philosophies and so one of the ones was looking at snakes and, and looking at this uh, particular characteristic that uh, snakes uh, have scales but the scales are not symmetric and so if you if you if you if, if you ever have the chance to to uh, touch a snake and you touch its belly if you go towards uh, the tail of the snake it, it's very smooth it, it's it's very very smooth, but if you go towards the head, uh, your your fingers get caught along uh, against the edge of the scales, and so in in biology this has been studied, and it's not only snakes, it's uh, a lot of different organisms. I mean even dogs and cats, right? We 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 pet them in one direction, like with along the grain of the hair, it's very smooth. We go against the grain of the the, the hair, it's very very rough. And so this is known in, in, in biology and physics as directional friction. So different amounts of friction depending on the direction. And so that brought, brought us to think, well, what if we brought some of these concepts, but now I put them on a pile. Is the pile going to have this behavior as well? Uh, or, or can we create an anchor that we can sink and install relatively easy, but then the skin friction during pullout is going to be really high, and so that that's been the question. Um, and uh, uh, so we've been focusing on that for for uh, about uh, six or seven years now. Um, the the and, and I know I'm mixing different things, but I think another part that I really enjoy about research is answering questions from different angles. And, and to do that, we need to use different tools. And, and one example is, if we run experiments, uh, let's say a triaxial test or, or a direct shear test or something like that, we only get limited information. We only get, for example, a force, a displacement, but we really cannot observe what's happening inside the soil. We, we can make inferences like maybe more angular particles give us higher strength, but it's hard to know if the particles are rotating more or if the particles are crushing or if we're shear banding. We can observe some from the outside, but, but we don't get a very complete picture. And so for those questions of what are the underlying mechanisms, what is really causing something to work in this way or another, uh, that's where we've been using numerical simulations, which allow us to look at the soil, to look inside the soil, to look at uh, you know, areas of high stress, of high deformations. Uh, and, and most of my work has focused on sands. And so the, the, the numerical tool we have been using is uh, discrete element modeling, which is, is a type of um, uh, tool that models each individual particle uh, in the simulation. And so if you have a triaxial specimen, 
that has 500,000 particles, you have 500,000 particles and you can track what each one is doing. So that just gives such a rich um, uh, just source of information to, to be able to understand this a lot more. So, I mean, to bring it all together, I have the applications that, that my, my, my uh, group focuses on, uh, deep foundation, site characterization, um, fabric effects and liquefaction are two others. Uh, I have the kind of source of um, maybe innovation. One of them is, is bioinspiration, bringing things from biology and, and seeing how we can uh, bring different behaviors and, and perhaps improve the attributes. And, and then there's the tools. And so we do experiments in the lab. Um, we do centrifuge tests that allow us to, to upscale things. Uh, we've done uh, some field tests as well, so even upscale more. But then we can really zoom in into the micro, the particle level, to now understand and be able to explain, well, this bioinspired process works better because it's doing this, as opposed to doing that. And so then that allows you to fine tune that process a little bit better. So that, that's kind of how it, how it all combines in, in what we've been doing. So you did use the word tools in there. And uh, so one of the tools you need is some laboratory facilities. And so I, uh, I happen to notice that there's a facility at UC Davis. It's called the uh, Granular Materials Laboratory. It's, it's not called the Soil Mechanics uh, Laboratory. And I, I, uh, I think that's on purpose. I, uh, when I read that, I'm thinking, oh, uh, a physicist would know what this means when you say granular materials lab, where he might not know soil mechanics. So it, it seems like it's a little more inclusive. So can you tell us a little bit about this lab and, and uh, what goes on there? Sure. Yeah, the 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 granular materials lab is, is is really just the name I gave to to my research group, and uh, so uh, it's not as much of a physical location, but rather it's uh, uh, it, it it's research equipment and it's people, and so those are students, postdocs, and and myself, um, and the the tools and the facilities we use are. A combination. We 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 own some of the equipment, uh, but also, uh, for example, we use the centrifuge facility quite a bit, and and that's separate. That's the Center for Geotechnical Modeling. That's that's funded by NSF. And so, um, you know, within all these people and tools and and centers and and even collaborators, that that's how we find kind of going back to the answer of the previous question, the best way to answer this part of the problem or, or that part of the problem. And so um, uh, I, I have an example here of, of one of the, the research projects. And so great, I'm going to uh, share my screen. So you see it here. I apologize yep. I, uh, here. So this one on the snakeskin uh, surfaces and, and piles. And so this kind of tells this story about the, the snakeskin project, right? The, the, this idea of, um, can we look at snakes? Snakes have this, uh, this characteristic directional friction. And so um, uh, it started by bringing 60 preserved snakes to the lab. These were not live snakes, they were uh, preserved specimens. Uh, and, and I remember when, when I had this idea and, and I, I had the meeting with the, the master's student that was going to do this work called the scanning, I was a little bit worried that she was just going to run out of my office and just say, uh, <laughs> I signed up for a geotechnical engineering master's. But she liked the idea a lot. And so we brought this uh, uh, snake specimens. We borrowed them from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. And we worked with a herpetologist. This is a biologist that works on, on snakes, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, Professor Brian Todd here at UC Davis. So we brought all of them here and then we scanned them. And so we got scans uh, like this one that you see at, uh, in the screen here. Um, and so we, we characterized the, the three dimensional geometry from there. Uh, one of the things we've been doing since, uh, since I joined UC Davis is use 3D printing uh, just because that allows us to, uh, in a very efficient manner, uh, create different parts of uh, our, our 
you know, research equipment. Not everything needs to 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 be made out of metals. We 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 realize, and so we can then take this uh, scans and modify them, idealize them, and three D printing, three uh, D print them, and so then this becomes our uh, testing surface. We we have the three D printers in the lab, so we can create hundreds of these ones if we want. We have that freedom. Then we put this in an interface shear uh, testing equipment. Uh, and so oh. you see here, yeah, you see the, the the surface in the bottom. Here we have sand. We moved into the centrifuge, and so we go there. And then uh, last year we we moved into the field. And so uh, I thought this kind of shows a, a nice progression of how we 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 um, uh, make it a priority to to go across the scales to 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 not be married to a tool. And um, I think this next example kind of uh, shows nicely this micro to macro approach. And so this, this is just a picture of our interface shear machine. And so with this type of machine, we can get, you know, stress strain relationships. Uh, we, we're applying a vertical load over here, a horizontal load, the, the specimen is in there. And so we can do that. Um, one of the unique things here is that uh, down here, hopefully you can see, there's a, a window. And so that window then can show us our specimen. And so this is our soil specimen. And so down here we have the, the snakeskin inspired surface. Uh, we do image analysis. And so for image analysis, uh, you need color contrast. And so to have that color contrast, we dyed the sand. In this case, it's blue, but it's natural sand. It's just dyed blue. And so then we can we can do this image analysis. And, and now you, you can understand the processes from two different perspectives. On the left, I have my stra uh, uh, stress displacement relationships. We can test different surfaces. For example, a very rough surface in the black is very strong. Compared to a smooth surface in, in, in the dashed line, it, it's weak. We know that. In the blue, that's our snakeskin surface. It's strong in one direction, weak in the opposite direction. So we see that. We measure it. But then doing the image analysis and looking at the, the micro scale behavior, now we understand when we go in, in this first direction, the cranial direction, we deform the soil a lot more. We see all these yellow regions. Those are regions of high deformation. But then if you stop and you start going the other direction, you don't deform the soil quite as much. And so this this shows uh, uh, now what exactly what's happening and, and why we see this behavior. And then just moving on to the next scale, moving up. Uh, this is the centrifuge that uh, is here at uh, UC Davis at the Center for Geotechnical Modeling. And so the, the, it has a radius of nine meters, so it's a really big machine. And so you see the people there for scale and so this centrifuge spins around this room. And so all the experiment is in here. So the, the whole uh, uh, concept of the centrifuge is you start spinning, and then you have a gravitational field that starts acting outwards. And so it pushes outwards, and so this bucket actually swings. And so if you look in there, here we have a pile, and then the pile can be instrumented. And, and so we can do all these tests, and, and you see a bed of sand over here. And finally, these are the field tests we did uh, uh, also with the snakeskin anchors. And so this is uh, at a site here at UC Davis. Um, we rented a, a drill rig, as you can see here. That's one of the technicians at UC Davis. And uh, this student here, he's actually an undergraduate student that helped us in the summer to run, run all these um, experiments. So this is one example. I, I have another example here which is uh, soil penetration in, in inspired by roots. And I, I mentioned this a little bit, but, but in, in biology, it's been observed that roots don't grow vertically down. One of the things they do is they, they do these helical motions. And um, the, the, this motion is called uh, circumnotation. It's, it's kind of a, a fancy word, but the, the, there's two theories for why this happens. One theory is um, it's just for obstacle avoidance. 
if the root is is kind of going like this, it's it's continuously searching for the weakest path, for the path of least resistance. That's one. But then the other one, uh, uh, so the first one has been confirmed, that hypothesis has been, has been confirmed in, in biology. The second one is that geomechanically, it reduces the penetration resistance by, by uh, adding this geometry that's tilted. So the tip is tilted. And then secondly, we're rotating, right? So the, the root is rotating. And so it's moving down with a velocity and then it's rotating with an angular velocity. And so that's really what we focus on. And this just shows the two different ways in which we're, we're doing it. One of them is experimentally with uh, a robotic arm. And so this robotic arm, uh, what it does is that it allows us to move our, this is our root inspired probe. You see it here, it, it has the bend at the end. And so we can move it down, we can move it to the side in any, any trajectory that we want. And so that's what the robotic arm helps us to do. Uh, and so we, we, and here we have a bed of sand, so we run experiments with, with this. And we also have simulations, and so these are discrete element modeling simulations where we can have the same probe here, but now we can look at what the particles are doing, what are the underlying mechanisms that, that lead uh, to this decrease in penetration resistance and, and, and so on. Um, and um, I mentioned 3D printing. Um, uh, just uh, and, and so I wanted to show it here. It, it's something we've been using a lot. It's been really helpful uh, in the lab. It's really expanded our capability. So these are two 3D printers. Um, and so we've done a range of things from um, 3D printing particles, as you see here, to look at the effect of particle shape on strength, stiffness, and so on. Uh, so that way you can control particle shape very precisely. But here, for example, you see different prototypes uh, of anchors that were 3D printed. And so what this progression is showing is from a very simplified uh, prototype that just has eight legs uh, to a very complex prototype. This actually comes from a scanned tree from the field. And so then you see all the intermediate uh, levels of complexity. And so then we can bring these prototypes to the centrifuge and then upscale the stresses and then look at what um, the capacities would be in the centrifuge. In this case, the, the 3D printing material, it's a plastic. <clears throat> it's actually quite nice because the, the, the stiffness and the tensile strength of this plastic is, is actually uh, similar to that of, of wood materials and root materials. So <clears throat> in, the, in that case, it actually helps us approximate the the properties of the 3D printed soil, uh, sorry, of the of the uh, root systems uh, better. Yep, so those are some of the examples of uh, how we go about research in, in, in our laboratory. Well, thanks for sharing uh, those images and, and, and talking about the different experiments. Um, it's uh, certainly a very unique type of testing, very unique type of work. Um, one of the other things that, that you did, and uh, you also mentioned in the article, is really to get uh, kind of proof of this whole concept uh, full scale. And so uh, my understanding is you also did some, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, pull-out tests on, on, on trees uh, that were full-grown uh, and the root system. And I, I really don't know anyone, unless you correct me, I don't know anyone else that's ever done this. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested, or we're all interested to see, you know, what type of equipment had to be used. I guess I could tell a little story. I, mean, I have a friend that's a farmer, um, and he has some, uh, you know, cherry trees. And he's explaining to me one day, he goes, you know, we don't, we don't climb the trees and pick the pear cherries anymore. So they just kind of spread a blanket on the ground. And they have this truck that comes by, and it's got a big arm, and the arm grabs onto the tree and shakes it. So I, I was wondering, you know, what, what are you doing? Is it something like that, or, 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 or what's the... Uh, What's involved uh, getting contractors or who can do this kind of testing and that kind of thing? Yes, the, these tests um, uh, done in collaboration with Jason the Young here at, at UC Davis. Uh, as you mentioned, they, they, they were very unique in, in how they how we had to go about them. And so it required some creative thinking and, and, and making, uh, fabricating our own equipment. And so, for example, here in the top, you see the, the the testing setup. 
Uh, what you see here is a, a tree in the middle. And so this whole setup is made to, to pull the tree out and measure, it load, measure its load displacement uh, uh, characteristics. Um, this is when sometimes being at a university, it kind of presents these opportunities that are unique. And so at UC Davis, uh, for those that don't know, UC Davis really started as an agricultural university. And so the plant science and, and ag programs at UC Davis are very strong. And so part of uh, the ag school, what they have is this teaching nursery. And so in this teaching nursery, they have the same type of tree that they plant every single year. And they've been doing this for, I don't know how many years, many years, decades. And so in the same field, the same site, same soil, same climate, same everything, you have the same tree, but that's one year old, in one row, next row, two years old, three years old, four years old, all the way to very mature. And the other unique aspect is that within the same year, within the same row, you have trees that have been grafted on different rootstocks. So you have a rootstock that's known for being really good for stability. You have a rootstock that's known for going very deep. You have a rootstock that's known for being more shallow. And so that's what we did. We picked one row, so one year, I think this were three-year-old trees. And um, we picked three different rootstocks to do our tests. Now, the unique part of this is you cannot bring the tree to your lab to test it. You have to bring your lab to the tree, right? And so that, that's what this is. The, the, the system is, uh, is, is a gantry crane and the trolley that we can roll and put on top of the, uh, of the tree. And so here you see the, the cross beam. Uh, over here we have a, a frame you see the, the, the crane is up there. And so this is all hand powered with uh, a series of pulleys. And so here somebody's pulling on the tree, but due to the pulley ratio, it doesn't really take a lot of force to, to pull it out. And so then that's, that's pulling the tree out. We have load cell, we have displacement sensors and so on. And that's how we measured it. Uh, this circle you see around this rail uh, was not for the pullout. This was to image uh, what was happening. And so at every uh, given displacement, we stopped and we took images around so that we could do uh, image processing to, to see how the, the root, uh, the soil root ball is being extracted. You can imagine as you pull the tree out, it, it kind of creates a mound. And so that's what we were interested, uh, interested on. And then once we pulled out the trees, we use LIDAR and other image analysis to then digitize the, 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 the architecture of the trees we pulled out and then try to bridge both parts. What attributes of the architecture led to higher capacities or higher stiffnesses, for example. So that, that's the setup. Uh, this is a picture of uh, towards the end of a pullout test when um, we see the separation of the root soil ball. So this is what I was telling you about. You see some of the instruments here. We're measuring how much uh, it's it's moving up at different locations. So those are this, these little weights over there. They're connected to displacement sensors up above. One more thing we had were accelerometers because a, a very important part in, in the load transfer process of a tree is root breakage. And actually, when we're doing these tests, you could feel how the ground shakes when, when a large root breaks. There's a lot of uh, load distribution. There's um, redistribution, I should say. You start pulling, and then one of the roots that was carrying a lot of load breaks. And then everything vibrates a little bit, and then you keep loading up, and then that load get re re gets redistributed. And so, this accelerometer has helped us identify those root breakage events. Uh, here's other pictures. So here you see the crane uh, from up above. And so this we could roll onto the site. And so the root is down there. This is early in the morning. And, and here you see another picture of the tree during 
uh, I pulled out a test. Um, so this, I, I, I don't want to get into the details a lot, but this just shows for the three different rootstocks. We tested uh, three trees for each. Uh, for, for this one, Lovell, we tested four. And so this just shows you how different rootstocks gave us, gave us very different load displacement characteristics, right? This one down here, the Meyer Ballen, has a high peak, highest capacity, but then it degrades, right? So in a way, this one's the strongest peak capacity. But you actually look at the Lovell one, and this tree is, this rootstock is really interesting in, in the, from the sense that you can keep pulling it for almost a, a foot, and it's not losing any capacity, right? So you're deforming and deforming and deforming, and, the, and the, that rootstock has the ability to redistribute the load to the other roots to, to never show that degradation of capacity uh, compared to the Meyer Ballen, right? And so these are the types of results that, that we got. And, and then we digitized the, the root ar architecture after pulling out and so, you know, one was very asymmetric. Uh, the other one was uh, very shallow, but more spread horizontally. And then this is the strongest one. It had uh, more inclined root, roots that reached greater depths. And so we, we were trying to link uh, these two. Um, this is just showing uh, a way of, of quantifying the architecture of the roots. Uh, and, and we quickly realized that that is a really big challenge. How do you characterize these very complicated shapes? Uh, and, and I mean, the, the field of plant science and forestry, I mean, there's a lot of work on this. Uh, and so what we did, did here is just characterize where is the surface area as a function of depth? And so this shows, for example, the Mariana one, the one in the middle, it's shallower. So a lot of its material it's at this shallow depth, whereas the strongest one, a lot of its material is towards deeper locations. And so, again, combining the, the field tests with the image analysis allows us to, to, uh, to bridge across these gaps and, 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 and get a little bit more in-depth understanding. Yeah, thanks for uh, for those descriptions, and uh, it certainly reminds us when you're showing, uh, you know, the whole process that that a lot of times just the designing the test itself uh, is an engineering challenge. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to, to what to do with the data, but uh, so at this point, really in the talk, we really described you know how you learned what you could from nature, um, mm. and and really what works best and what doesn't, and, and now it's time to try to design or to engineer uh, uh, an anchor system. Um, and I know you told me that, you, that this wasn't all done at, uh, at, at UC Davis, that, that, that some of this was done at Georgia Tech, and, and you, know, you, have, uh, you have a mm -hmm. co-author, uh, uh, Professor Frost as well, who may have done a lot of this. But could you tell us a little bit about you know, what, what went into the, the engineering, the, the mechanisms and, and the, uh, the actual anchors that, that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you're looking at now? Yeah, certainly. And, and as you mentioned, Ken, uh, at Georgia Tech, they have been doing very nice work on creating prototypes that can be installed in the field. Because that, you know, that is the, the question that always comes up when we talk about this root-inspired anchors. Uh, and, and the natural question is, well, the geometry is very complicated. How are you going to install it? And so uh, at Georgia Tech, they, they've been working on prototypes. There's other groups around the country and internationally that are working on, on that. In a way, we took uh, a different angle on this. And, and before going towards the prototype, uh, we started focusing more on the, the trying to understand what are the attributes of the architecture that link to higher capacity or that link to the mechanical behavior. And so our work has uh, focused on that. Um, I don't have a slide for it here, but it's it's uh, it's described in the article in in the Geostrata magazine, uh, and so we've been focusing on that using the centrifuge, 
Um, before I move on to the next topic, I, I did want to show this. Uh, that this comes from our field tests, and so same same results. And we just did a simple exercise where we uh, calculated the efficiency of the root systems. And so that, that's this. If you take the capacity that was mobilized by the different trees, the different root systems, we have the three, and you normalize it either by its volume or, or its mass, you get these quantities. This is a capacity per unit volume. Right, so for the different rootstocks, you get 2,000 kilonewtons per every meter cubed of, of material, for example. But then the thing we did is we, we made a calculation for if you had a pile or micro pile and you needed to get the same capacity as the trees, as the root systems, what volume would you need for that? What volume of a micro pile would give you these capacities. And uh, just to kind of highlight how efficient the root systems are, then we divided the efficiency of the root system to the efficiency of the micropile. And it turns out that root systems are 10 to 12 to 17 times more efficient mm. than a micropile. And so, you know, there's real benefits to be gained here. If what we're trying is to get um, tensile capacity out of a root system, uh, or out of an anchor, really, uh, going with a more complicated architecture can give us improvements, not of 10%, but here we're talking about 10, 15 times bigger. Um, so uh, moving on to a different type of anchor uh, and, and, and going back to talking about the snakeskin anchor. And this project, we, we have been doing more work on how we actually implement this in the field. And so I already showed this, this picture of us doing field tests. Um, we did tests in, in a sand uh, a site and then a, a silty clay site. And to do this, we, we fabricated this um, snakeskin uh, anchor prototypes. These aren't uh, piles. Uh, for this application, we're looking more at uh, uh, soil nails or tieback anchors, so more for uh, like earth retention. Uh, and so they look like this. You see the, the geometry there. And so this is in our site with our drill rig. We're, we're pulling out the anchor. And so uh, we took everything we learned from the laboratory, from the centrifuge. And uh, uh, the main thing we did here is we changed the, the geometry of the asperities. So we were playing with the, uh, the length of the asperities and the height of the asperities. Uh, I have a picture here that shows it better. So this shows just the range of anchors that we tested. So, so from short and, and, and very mild asperities as shown here, to very aggressive asperities, to very long and aggressive asperities. Uh, and so what's the effect of this? And, and so we're trying to optimize this anchor. And uh, as a point of uh, comparison, we said, well, let's have something really rough and, and something that uh, is used in practice. And so in practice, sometimes we drive anchor uh, we, we drive rebar into the ground as anchors. And so we also tested uh, rebar. And so uh, these are some of the results. This shows, uh, this is uh, uh, for, for all intent, intents and purposes, a uh, load displacement curve. Here I just normalized the load to get a stress ratio. And um, the, the, the green dashed line is the rebar. And so the rebar kind of our point of comparison gave us the smallest capacity. Uh, this is for when we keep the length of the asperities the same and we're just changing the height. And so we see we have very short asperities, 0.5 millimeters. We, we get a similar response as the rough rebar anchor. But if we really go aggressive and have really tall asperities, four millimeters, then we can improve that capacity by a factor of five or six. And so what we're doing here is we're changing how we're transferring the load to the soil. And so that's one set of results. This other set of results shown in the right is just showing how we uh, change the behavior if we keep the same height of the asperity, but now we're changing the length. And so it shows that that affects it. But uh, one of the main takeaways is the strength of these anchors uh, can be a lot higher of just uh, of, uh, of a rebar anchor. 
Now, moving into the future, what we need to do is to uh, tackle some of the, the implementation challenges. How do you manufacture these anchors uh, in an economical way and in, in more efficient ways? How do we install them in the field? How do they integrate with exi existing equipment? And so that, that's work that uh, we're, we're focusing on. Uh, for this work, we, we really need to collaborate with practitioners and people that do this day in and day out. And so that's a collaboration of a different kind. We're not collaborating with uh, biologists anymore. We would be now collaborating with practitioners and contractors. Well, thank you. I, uh, you may have covered actually part of our, our closing statement, which was on what's next. Um, so implementation is one thing. Um, are there other applications of bio-inspired uh, um, foundation elements that you're foreseeing uh, down the road or uh, anything else coming up? Yeah, the 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 so and I think I can I can stop sharing. So let let, let me just stop sharing here for a minute. There you go. Um, yes, I, I think this is uh, the the field of bioinspired geotechnics is very rich. I mean, we're really just scratching the surface. We've looked at uh, roots. We've looked at uh, earthworms, snakes, certain clams, but you know that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of organisms that interact with the ground. And so really we're just scratching the surface. The possibilities are almost endless. And, and, and really a lot of times there's too many possibilities and the challenge is narrowing down the possibilities to, to what's closest to, to the geotechnical system. Um, the other work that's really relevant to, to geotech that has been advancing, uh, a lot of it is on, on anchorage systems like we're doing here. Uh, and so the snake skin and, and the tree roots are, are the ones that are more advanced. Um, there's um, really interesting work on delivery of sensors and and um, the you know 10 year, 20 year, 50 year plan is to be able to deliver sensors and to characterize sites, but not in a way that as we do it now. Right now, we, we take an SPT or, or we do a boring or a CPT and we go from the surface and we go vertically down. So we drive to the location, we go down and then we drive to the next location and we don't go down. The, the, the long term goal is to be able to have a, a tool that can go down, but then can start changing direction so that if you are interested in a particular weak layer, Imagine you have a, a sensitive clay seam and you really want to target that and characterize that well. If you're able to go along the seam, then uh, that gives you a lot more data than just going vertically. Uh, or um, installing sensors underneath structures, right? Or underneath a dam, that's very challenging. We have very limited access to the foundation soils of dams. And so if we could go from the side and then go underneath the dam, for example, or even other applications that, that go beyond geotechnical engineering, space exploration. How do you more efficiently explore the soils in asteroids or in Mars or in the moon, uh, right? And so that, that, that's more in the future. That's a big challenge of how you uh, deliver the sensor, how you change directions. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work on, on wireless sensors. How do you send the sensor, but then it, if, if, if you don't have a rod string and you don't have a cable, how do you send the, the, the data back to the surface and how do you capture it? So there's a lot of work in that area. That's very exciting because I think that can really uh, have a, a big impact in geotechnical engineering, but but also in other other areas, like I said, space exploration and, and contaminant um, uh, remediation and, and location of how plume is moving, for example. Uh, and so uh, it, it, I think it's a field that has a lot of promise. I think if if it's a field that also brings a lot of implementation challenges as well, and, and it really requires collaboration. Like, for example, also with mechanical engineers that that may be looking at how you know, a, a probe may bend and change directions for, for that example. Or as simple as how do you design an installation tool uh, for the for the root inspired anchor? If you want to make something so complex, 
uh, it becomes a, a mechanical engineering problem at that point. And so there's a lot of these uh, interactions that, that need to happen. Um, but I think in the long term, if, if we're successful in developing these ones uh, and in, in integrating them with practice and um, making them competitive from a cost point of view to an efficiency point of view and integrating them with, with our current um, uh, construction tools and methods, then I, I think this can bring big big gains in, in efficiency and, and bring very new and unique capabilities that we don't have. Well, thank you for, uh, for participating in this interview. I, I, I think your questions and, and answers were, were very enlightening and, and really uh, kind of expanded a bit, you know, on the paper and, and uh, showed everyone what else is involved with it. Um, we do have a couple of uh, questions that came over in the chat. Um, the first one, Actually, it may be more related to biomediated rather than bio-inspired, but uh, the question is, can animal waste be used as admixtures to impugn the ground? Here in Nepal, which is quite far, uh, we use animal dung to make the soil fertile. So I guess he's looking to see if, if, uh, mm. if there's more <laughs> that, uh, that could be done uh, with, uh, with animal dung. I, I don't know particularly for uh, animal dung uh, for improving strength, but I, I know that um, in, in the work of a ground improvement, finding other materials that can uh, strengthen soil and stabilize soils, but at the same time reduce greenhouse emissions from, for example, uh, concrete or uh, some of these materials that we have been using, but but they have environmental impacts. That that's high priority, and that can have uh, uh, high impacts. And so, I mean, what I've seen in the literature ranges from the biosedimentation process or adding enzymes. Uh, maybe this is a good one, where um, there are simple processes that can be used to extract enzymes from. I mean, I've seen some from like watermelon seeds, or jack beans, or bananas. If you can extract those enzymes, and, and, and again, these are not very complicated processes. These involve mixing the, 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 the organic material with water and, and perhaps some ions, and then passing it through a filter. That gives you enough enzyme, and that stimulates bacteria that can then uh, strengthen the soil. And so there's that. I've seen people using um, other type of waste materials. I've seen people using almost... Uh, even human hair to 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 strengthen soils uh, as well, and so there's many many possibilities of of what what could be done, and um, the the two kind of uh, attractive parts. One is certainly the reduced greenhouse emissions, so increased sustainability. But I mean, I think another one is the 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 concept of using organic materials that can degrade so that the impact of human activities doesn't stay there forever, right? If we, if we don't mix concrete, for example, if what we mix was an organic material, we know it's stable for 50 years. Maybe that's enough for whatever structure that's going to go there. And then in 50 years, it's going to start degrading and then it's going to go away. And so then the site will go back to to kind of its natural equilibrium. So there's there's also that point of view of, of considering the the temporal temporal aspect of ground improvement. We have uh, one more question, um, uh, and this is related to the bio and fire topic. Um, it may be just answered somewhat in the uh, in the in the article, uh, but perhaps we could review it a little more here. The question is, what was the driving resistance and the pullout resistance for snake skin anchor piles? Which one was more? Um, and just my own interpretation, I think he's saying, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could drive it easily and then have a high pullout? I mean, yeah. it seems as though in one case, you don't want much resistance. In the other yes. case, you want a lot. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the answer is yes. Uh, we, we have created those anchors and those piles. The, the anchors and the piles with this texture, it depends on the uh, on the specific geometry of the asperities, but we can get as much as three times larger pullout resistance than driving force. And so imagine a pile that uh, you can 
uh, or, or an anchor that you can install with half the force uh, compared to its pull out capacity. And so that we have shown uh, and, and uh, that, that, can, that can already be done. Yeah, so th that's part of the uh, attractive uh, part uh, of, of this technology. Well, thank you for that, and, and thanks for all the time. Uh, I know it, it, it takes time to write these articles, and you certainly took the time to prepare for this interview and, and conduct it for us today, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, so we're at the end of this, and I think Brad is going to come back and, and, and tell us all something. That sounds good. Not only am I going to tell you something, I'm going to tell you many things. And the first thing I will say is that you guys did a really good job. So thanks, Alejandro. I mean, this is an absolutely fascinating topic. I think when uh, Ed Cavazangian did his Terzaghi lecture in Charlotte now almost two years ago, I, I thought it was one no offense to all the Terzaghi lecturers out there. I thought it was one of the coolest ones we've had because almost anyone could have walked in off the street and found that interesting. He kind of told the whole story of bio-inspired, and it was a little bit of a history lesson. There was some technical stuff in there too, but there there was really a lot to learn about how this this field has developed, and that it, it's such a cool story. So mm -hmm. thank you, Alejandro, like Ken said, for doing this article and taking the time to uh, to do it. And for researching such cool topics, <laughs> we absolutely appreciate that. Yeah, for, thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. For everybody who watched today, thanks for the questions. Thanks for hanging around till the end. Uh, if you liked what you saw, and again, you are here at the end, so hopefully you did. Of course, click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we will lovingly from the bottom of our hearts let you know if every time we post something to the youtube channel again this was our 100th live stream the 10th anniversary of our youtube channel is coming up on monday and everybody needs to watch out we're going to have a special contest associated with that that you could win a discounted registration to geo congress in vancouver next february so you will want to be a part of that all we're going to do is ask your opinion. That's it. And you could be a winner. So take part in that. Our next live stream will be September 7th. It will be Tim Stark's third Cross USA lecture that's live streamed. You can find details on that and everything else we have coming up, including Terzaghi Day, on our Eventbrite page. So make sure that we see you again on the YouTube channel soon. Our producer today was Sean Herpelsheimer. Thanks everybody for watching and we will see you again soon. Bye, thank you again. <laughs>